thank you for being here on Consumer International uh, Congress. And we thank you for being here on this specific session on serving up a food system that works for people and planet. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, the word systems there could be the underlying factor that is determining quite a lot of things when it comes to food and nutrition security. You know, we faced challenges with the system itself. Challenges that we need to ask whether the system is working or not. These challenges include, if you take statistics, between the year 2019 to 2022, that is December last year, about 200 million people were added into the bracket of uh, the poor, and they were facing hunger. Agriculture itself, or food system itself, actually uh, contributes to about 80% loss of biodiversity. You know, about a third of global emissions also come from agriculture and food system itself. Climate change, therefore, is something that is contributed to a great deal with the activities that we do in agriculture, in food systems, production, processing, along the chain. The question, therefore, is, is the system working or it's broken? We have also for a long time looked at the system linearly, where concentration has been on the production side. The question is, why haven't we taken a value chain approach when we're looking at the issue of food systems? The United Nations, in 2021, formed the Food Systems Transformation, which conversation ended up in a summit in New York that came up with pathways and action tracks that would be able to help countries to look into the issue of food systems transformation. A conversation is going on. Here in Kenya, we just presented a good case on the food system transformation in Rome this year, which was actually a follow-up from the summit that happened in New York last year, I mean in 2021. The bigger conversation today is that when we talk about food systems, are we looking at it, number one, on a value chain approach from the production all the way through to consumption. When we come to consumption, this is where we meet the consumers. That is the demand end of the food system. So the question now that is we have today is, what are we doing on the demand side? Are we addressing the right uh, factors on the demand side that will help us with a holistic view and therefore holistic transformation of our food systems. It is called the value chain approach, and that is what we are looking for, the farm to fork concept. With us today, to have us through in this very interesting and exciting conversation, serving up a food system that works for people and the planet, is a pool of experts that we have, six of them, I mean five of them, and I would want us to listen as they share with us their experiences, uh, that will be very, very exciting, and then we'll draw from there. Quickly, I will introduce them. I have from, on my left, uh, Alice Kemunto, from a, the, who is the executive director of the Consumer Grassroots Association, which is a Kenyan consumer organization. Alice, could you say hi to the audience? He's told me to say hi, so hi. <laughs> <laughs> Just on my immediate right is uh, Ruth Okoa, who is the country director of Kenya, uh, Kenya for Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, which we call it GAIN. Uh, Ruth, could you say hi to the audience? Good morning, everyone. And then we have Gret Garrett, who is the executive director of the Access to Nutrition Initiative. Gret, could you say hi to the audience? Good morning. Good morning. And then I have Temi. Uh, Temi is the managing partner of Sahel Consulting. Uh, Temi, could you say hi to the audience so that they hear your voice? Good morning, everyone. And then last but not least, <laughs> uh, they say save the best for last. And that's why I put Maria over there. Yes. So Maria is the executive director of Tribuna, an Ecuadorian consumer organization, all the way from South America. Could you say hi to the audience? Hi, everyone. 
Good morning. A round of applause for the <coughs> experts, please, which is OK. Now, we have a time constraint here. I think we've lost a few minutes already. And I would request, therefore, that we go into it straight away. But even as we do, a few things will really help us to navigate the time issue. Let's be specific. Today, we want to talk about solutions. We will have the time to converse about the other constraints later. We know uh, the bulk of the demand that is required on us. <clears throat> Besides that, also, we could still have the audience and experts and interact with them outside uh, after the session is over. Uh, so we'll have very few minutes. But uh, to start us off, ladies and gentlemen, is a short video of Dr. Tedros Adhanom, who is the WHO Director General that is going to set us in motion uh, about the issue of uh, uh, serving up uh, the food uh, systems that work for people and the planet. Let's uh, listen to this short video, please. Um, could we? Director General Helen Mirren, Unit Executive Director, Inc. and the the choices and our plates. They affect our health, our ecosystems, our social systems, and the health and well-being of future generations. Our food choices are linked with global challenges such as greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, social inequity, malnutrition, and non-communicable diseases. As consumers, we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to make informed decisions about the food we buy. And governments have the responsibility to ensure that each of us can make an informed and healthy choice. But around the world, more than 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. We need to transform our food systems to support the production and consumption of healthier and more diversified, more plant-based and sustainable diets. These policies must involve standard setting, regulation, fiscal policies, and public food procurement. WHO is supporting countries with evidence-based policy guidance and tools, and by working with partners such as Consumers International. As policymakers, public health professionals, and consumer organizations, you can join the effort to drive action for healthier diets a cleaner planet for all. I thank you. Hope you're back on mic. All right, so with that said, and uh, to start us off now in the conversation, I want to start here at home, and actually I want to start with the grassroots movement. So Alice, Consumer grassroots actually believe strongly that consumers should know about and also be engaged in food production and also work actively in this particular area. Why is it so important for consumers to engage throughout the food systems, not only production, but also on the processing, distribution, up to the consumption itself? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing this uh, Congress to Kenya, first of all. And I want to appreciate the panel uh, that is here. Um, getting this opportunity to share, especially about the grassroots organizations, and especially us as Consumer Grassroots Association, is a very uh, rare opportunity. So my name is Alice Kemito, Consumer Grassroots Association Kenya. We work 
with consumers right at the grassroots here in Kenya. Why is it important that consumers should be involved uh, in the food value chain? Uh, one, uh, we, we've just taken our food right now. So food is everything to us. Without food, there's no life. So consumers should be involved and be concerned about the food that they eat. We need to be involved because we are to make informed choices. For a consumer to make an informed choice, then they need to know what's happening along the value chain. Consumers are supposed to be enlightened on the laws that are protecting them when it comes to food systems. Our consumers are the ones funding the whole food system. I mean, everywhere, all over the world, is consumers that are making sure that food systems are sustained through the purchases that they make, through the profits that they give to um, the, the value, other value uh, chain actors. So it's important for consumers to be involved right from production up to the tail end of consumption. Consumers also need to know, need to own the food system. You cannot own what you don't know. You can only own what you are aware of. So, and that's why we are encouraging consumers, especially those at the grassroots level, to ensure that they know their food systems very well so that we can attain food sovereignty. Food sovereignty cannot be achieved if consumers are not educated, they don't know what's happening in the ecosystem. So it's quite important for consumers, and especially I'm talking of a consumer right at the grassroots, to get happening in the ecosystem in order to make informed choices, to own the food system, and also to ensure that together with other value chain actors, they, uh, we achieve sustainable food systems transformation. Oh, thank you so much. It's actually, just um, a follow up on that, you say what they need to know, but in the practical sense, could you share with the audience, what do they need to do so that they will be able to know what they need to know in terms of the agroecology, uh, practices and also the sovereignty that you've already talked about in practical sense. Uh, uh, before I respond to that, uh, as Consumer Grassroots Association, we have a project that we're implementing in Kenya and with our partner from Uganda that's consent uh, and it's called uh, Consumer Engagement for Sustainable Food Systems Transformation. And this project is bringing down the information and educating consumers on agroecology, and we're encouraging consumers to uptake agroecology as a viable uh, practice, a viable and, and alternative system of uh, farming, and that is not only friendly to humans, but also friendly to plants, friendly to the environment, and that's what we call agroecology. Basically, we are practicing and encouraging the practicing and implementation of ecological practices in our food systems. And that way, we are able to protect Mother Earth, we are able to protect ourselves, and we are able to ensure that the future generations are not going to have a deficiency when it comes to food and nutrition. And uh, as an organization and other partners, we work closely with uh, uh, other civil society organizations. We have a coalition of uh, consumer organizations and also a coalition of right to food uh, organizations. What we are trying to do is uh, to ensure that we educate uh, consumers about agroecology. You asked what they need to do. As consumers, they need to demand for safe food food that is going not only to be safe for them, but also for the environment. That's number one. Number two, they need, as consumers, they need to demand for laws that are going to be consumer friendly, laws that will protect consumers, laws that are going to encourage uh, production of food that will be sustainable. So consumers need to take an active role in production, an active role in distribution, and an active role in ensuring that the legal framework lives beyond their age and time. Thank you, Alice. Actually, we get it clearly. A legal framework and also them practically taking the role, yes. and they need that environment to, to, to do this. Um, taking this to the next uh, uh, expert here, 
who is uh, Ruth uh, from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Ruth uh, is, uh, works in Kenya, but that is part of the global uh, movement for gain. And I think, uh, Ruth, you really have some statistics presently, especially on uh, the cost of food today. Actually, about six to 12 million US dollars, actually trillion US dollars, it just goes on that as part of cost of food. Uh, we met with you just, I think, two days ago, and this conversation was going on. Would you really share with the audience how this really affects the ability of the consumers uh, to have the healthy diet that they need on their table? Thank you very much, uh, Amisi, for that question. Yes, um, we've seen globally the cost of food rising, and uh, Kenya is not spared. We've seen a global trend of having you know, high cost of food. And that has impact different. It impacts differently in different parts of the continent. And for Sub-Saharan Africa, we know very well that this is one of the disadvantaged parts of the world. The, cost, the rise in cost of lead, living has resulted in people not being able to afford nutritious foods. So people would go for food that is affordable, but naturally is not nutritious. So uh, we've seen that uh, people going for overprocessed food, uh, food that is high in oil, um, so salt, and sugar, which definitely has health implications on them. We've also seen a majority, particularly the low-income households, reducing food portions just as a way of coping, as a coping me mechanism for them, that they have to find something to eat, or reducing the frequency of food. Again, we are experiencing an interesting dietary pattern, particularly in Kenya, where people now resort to more starchy food because it is filling in the tummy, but it is not nutritious. And they forgo foods like fruits, vegetables, and other animal source protein or other forms of protein. So what am I saying in short? We are slowly seeing a population that is very unhealthy a population that has health implications because of what they're eating. We are seeing continuously, if you look at the last released Kenya Demographic and Health Survey, we're seeing that we are const constantly having cases of stunting, even in the counties in this country, that naturally did not have high levels of stunting for children. We've seen high rise in obesity and other non-communicable diseases. This is because people are trying to cope, to make sure they have something in their body, in their, in their tummy, but not necessarily having nutritious food. Not that they don't know what to eat. A majority, as been said by Alice, a majority of the consumers are very well informed, but they don't have the purchasing power to buy the right food. Um, it, we know that in, in this country, 54% uh, of the household budget goes towards food, and for the low income, uh, household is about 60%. You can imagine if you have to spend more than that to have a nutritious food. So it is becoming practically impossible for most households to have nutritious food. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Ruth. This is a very worrying trend that you, you share here. Uh, but uh, today is about solutions. What, what would be the interventions <laughs> that you can share, especially for uh, the movements like GAIN and also for government, you know, organizations that also rally around the consumers. What would be the interventions that you think can be done? Because we're in this situation, we need to get out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree we have to get out of this situation. One of the things that we know that we cannot get out of this situation if we don't have the food. So the government needs to invest a lot in agriculture. This is what will give us the food. We cannot say we are going to import food. No, that is becoming difficult it's or next to impossible. So in investment, first the government needs to invest in agricultural infrastructure. And in the infrastructure, I mean in irrigation. Let us look at transportation, the road network, the rail network. Let us look at the storage. Let us look at the chillers, the, the coolers, the dryers. 
are we at a level that we can say that we have those that can help us have, um, move agriculture to the next level? We've also seen that in many of the sub-Saharan -Sub African countries, we still do rudimentary agriculture. Sorry for using that word. Agriculture is not mechanized, and therefore our productivity is also, the yield is also very low. We need to mechanize agricultural production so that we can increase on the yields. If we don't do that, we'll always be having food shortage and therefore moving to malnutrition, which is a very heavy burden for most of the African countries. Uh, I also believe that the, we need to invest a lot in research. We have certain crops or certain seeds that are drought tolerant. We know them, they existed in Africa before, in other continents before, but they are fading away. We can also introduce new uh, seed crops that are high in nutrients that would help us, you know, regenerate uh, nutrients in the body. So we need to do a lot of research as a country and see what seed crops do we move to the farmers. Farmers also lack extension services. They are willing to work, they are willing to, do, to, to, to grow crops, but they need a lot of technical input, they need a lot of capacity building. Yeah. Often at time this is lacking. And you find people saying young people are not willing to get into farming. No, it's because they find it very uh, labor intensive. Mm -hmm. They need to find it more exciting, let me use the word, more sexy to get involved in that. Yeah, yeah. I also believe that we need um, a policy space that actually promotes sustainable agriculture. A policy state is a space that also um, regulates food prices. You know, the food prices for now is left to anybody who produces it to determine the price that they should sell it for. For example, uh, we realize that a, a producer, a farmer produces, a, you know, for example, maize at five shillings, ten shillings. But at the time it reaches to the consumer, it's more or less 10 times and is the consumer bearing that cost? So we really need policies that would regulate food prices. And again, an enabling envi environment for food distribution and food production. In that way, if everything is well placed in order, we'll move to the next level. And finally, we know that most of the food distribution, most of the food value chain, food value chain are actually enabled by SMEs. SMEs are the ones that move from one level to the other, the foods, from production to transportation to the last mile and then to the consumer. They're often the most neglected, often lacking financial cap capacity or financial support to be able to grow their businesses. I think it's high time that governments consider SMEs that are in the food system and support them in terms of technical support, but also looking at their financial needs. How can they be capacitated to be able to grow their businesses? And in that way, let us have enough food for no, everyone. No, no. Th thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ruth. I actually allowed you to advance the second last point, because um, uh, for the audience benefit uh, in the food systems transformation conversation, um, Kenya just adopted uh, five pathways, and one of them is the youth in yes. agriculture. So well, that, that came in very handy. Thank you. And this now let me, make me move to Greg. Greg, you have an excellent task with Access to Nutrition Initiative of trying to ensure that uh, those who are involved uh, really have, new, uh, really take care or appreciate the nutritious value of whatever they're doing without passing this course to the consumers. I mean, I say that is not an easy task to start with. Uh, but we've heard from Ruth what institutions like governments can do. How about when you bring us down to where the rubber meets the road, the manufacturers, the retailers, what do you think can be done so that we ensure that our food are nutritious by the time it reaches our table? Thank you for the question. Before I get to the solution, what I believe is a major part of the solution for ensuring food retail and food and beverage manufacturers are part of that solution, I want to present four, I think, critical trends around the market that we should all be aware of. And these four trends are applicable to Kenya, yeah. so middle-income countries, but also low-income and high-income. First is talk about the uh, risk factors driving the global burden of disease. Every time we see a new release on the global burden of disease, more than half of those risk factors are related to diet and poor foods. And 
we could also talk about planet. We all know that um, greenhouse gas emissions are largely driven, at least 30 to 40 percent, by the food system. The second major trend is around the costs of food. And Ruth, you started to touch on this. If you go into a food environment, you'll see the actual cost of food and you'll purchase that. What we're not taking into account are the negative externalities. So globally, the cost to food, to poor health, and also to the planet is double that of the actual product. So we need to cost in the negative externalities. Thirdly, if you go into a food retail environment, I'm talking about modern grocery retail, in Kenya, in the US, in China, the situation is largely the same with processed foods, packaged foods. The data we're sitting on, looking at about 30% of sales derived from these packaged foods around the world, indicate that 70% of these foods are unhealthy. And that's actually using a government-endorsed, internationally recognized profile model. They're too high in salt, sugar, and fats. They're often ultra-processed or highly processed, and that's unhealthy. So 70% of the foods are unhealthy. And then lastly, and this is the part that is really unfortunate, food retail, which are selling those products, is growing all around the world, and it's growing fastest in middle-income and low-income countries. Here in Kenya, the data I've seen from Euromonitor indicates that over the last five years, we've seen anywhere from 11% growth per annum to well over 20% of the modern grocery uh, retail outlet. So we have a problem if we don't handle it, but there are solutions. Uh, we're working, we're trying to work constructively with food retail and food and beverage manufacturers and asking them to do two things very, very concretely. One, can you please transparently put out to the consumer but also to government and to investors, which is a critical part here, the shareholders and the bondholders of food companies, how healthy is your food portfolio? How much of your revenue is derived from healthy foods versus unhealthy foods? And see if by 2030, you can get to 50% of your sales derived from healthy products. That's objective number one. And number two is stop marketing unhealthy foods to children. These food and beverage manufacturers, the vast majority of them continue to market unhealthy foods to children under the age of 18, and that is causing a problem as well. Investors are a big part of the solution, so if we can give that data to shareholders and also to government, it will also make it to consumers eventually. And I think those three, policymakers, investors, and consumers, can, can, can be a big part of the solution. Yeah. No, good. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Greg. And <clears throat> now, indeed, I just saw one other grocery of this nature coming in my neighborhood. It's never been there for, for, for years, and I saw one. So, so your strategy is correct. This is growing and is worrying. But just uh, we need just the practical aspects. Just, I just want to have some consumers here. We are all consumers here. Get out of this room and know that maybe day one I can do this. And, and some consumer organization know that maybe day one we should change our, 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 our perspective and start doing this. What one or two things you can share on the practical sense of what the consumers can do about this? And that's why we're very happy to be here as Access to Nutrition Initiative, because we've been, we've been primarily B2B, business to business. We need consumers. We need the consumer organizations to take up the issue of food as a major cause. If we all agree that it is one of the, if not the major risk factor, poor diets driving the global burden of disease, every single consumer-facing organization should have food front and center in its strategy. And we would like to be able to provide the data on products and on companies to those consumer organizations so you can educate the consumer which companies are doing the right things and moving towards 2030 objectives and which uh, companies are not doing the right thing. And with uh, Consumers International next year and other partners, we will be working on a CEO compact where we're pushing forward CEOs of food and beverage companies and retailers to sign up to 2030 targets. And we would like Consumer International and all their affiliates to show the consumers who are the companies doing the right things by those products no. and maybe ignore the other ones. No, thank you. <laughs> I think thank that's you. spot on. Yes. Um, tell me, I want to go to it straight away without mentioning words. Let's look at the trade part of it. Um, this is one sector which actually is still very much developed by things like monopolies, you know, over concentration or some of this. Uh, retailers or the manufacturers, you go to a place, this is the only thing you find, you don't have a choice. Could you share with us how those type of uh, practices 
or scenarios that we have are affecting the consumer's ability to be able to access what they really need, the nutritious, safe food. Much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Is the mic working? OK. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think I will start by just quickly touching on uh, what trade distortions or market concentration really is all about. Um, I mean, they are very familiar terms. Trade distortion is you know, basically, uh, or are basically obstacles that disrupt uh, free and, and competitive market. And where you have trade distortions, then you have a lot of uh, uh, negative ramifications to it, especially as it directly relates to consumers' access to food. Um, on the other hand, market concentration is also, uh, also has its own negative effects. Uh, you know, and there are quite a number of cases of market concentration where you have uh, a few entities uh, wielding significant control over uh, certain elements of the value chain. And um, there are quite a number of impacts that are directly related to access to food by consumers. The first is on price, uh, where you have trade distortions. Uh, in tariff increases um, or levies or different trade barriers, uh, either uh, due to political uh, actions or inactions or, or actions from the private sector or development organizations, then you, you, you find uh, situations where uh, consumers really struggle to, to, to actually access some really essential food uh, products uh, due to high prices. I think Ruth mentioned um, that uh, we, we currently have about, uh, in, in Kenya, about 54% I heard uh, of household income being spent on food. In Nigeria, it's about, it's about 57. Uh, so you see that um, the disposable income uh, for food and household items continue to shrink. And um, you also have high prices due to these trade distortions. So that's a very negative impact on, on, on access to food. Uh, the other one I would like to talk about is limited competition, because when you have market concentration, uh, then you realize that um, you, you have a few large organizations or companies controlling very significant amounts of activities within the supply chain or across the value chain. Uh, what that means is that you have situations of monopoly, um, a few companies really, um, really controlling all of the activities within the chain. Uh, what that also uh, would give to you is limited access to a variety of food and food choices of consumers. Uh, that will really you know, go down. And you're likely going to have situations of what we technically call uh, corporate capture of, of the government because uh, they're very powerful, they're large uh, scale uh, enterprises. They have access to uh, mostly, almost unlimited resources. Uh, so they can actually engage with the government and deal with civil society organizations the way they want. Uh, so these are really serious issues uh, of concern, especially as it comes to consumers' access to, to food. Um, the last one I will talk about is really the impact on small, small producers. And that is very important, especially within the African context where, um, I think one of the panelists already mentioned it, where we have the majority of our food uh, being produced and controlled by, by SMEs. Uh, where you have situations of, of market concentration, then you realize that uh, the SMEs will struggle to compete uh, because they don't even have the power, they don't have the resources to really compete at the same scale uh, as these large organizations. And what you see is that there's a lot of consumers that will really, really, really struggle um, to be able to access the right commodities. Okay. Uh, no, tell me, thank you. Um, uh, this whole issue of uh, the monopolies, distortions, this, this happens when we talk trade, they happen at the local level, mm -hmm. they happen across the borders at the regional level, continental and globally. So to follow up on uh, what you've just said, what, what would you share with the audience as solutions uh, to some of these challenges? And I would want, probably we hear it, what, what happens at the micro level and then as we go even to the macro level? national, international institutions, this way. Thank you very much. I, I think, uh, to be very specific, um, there are a number of things that we need to do very urgently. Uh, the first is we need, 
You know, uh, we say government will or political will. I would say we need more than that. We need political action uh, and very deliberate investments in, in bridging the infrastructure gap, especially when you talk about it at the micro and community level. Um, for example, uh, the large part of what we produce today actually goes to waste. Uh, so there are very uh, serious issues of post harvest losses, about 40%, uh, sometimes up to 45% in some value chains. Uh, how do we make sure that um, we really crowd in a lot of funding and investment in ensuring that we bridge the, the, the infrastructure gap at the community level? Instances around uh, issues with um, you know, limited access to storage at the local level. So we need a lot of regional storage facilities to actually be able to address that issue. Uh, the other part is uh, we need to address the issues around cost of transportation of, of commodities. Mm -hmm. um, today, the cost of transporting certain food items uh, from the counties or from the regional level to, to, the, to the national level in, in, in so many countries, especially in Africa, is really so high. And that's really due to you know, a number of um, you know, issues around multiple tax, taxation and, and levies uh, on the road and all of that. So we need to creatively think about uh, sustainable transportation solutions to be able to move food across, across the board. And when we look at it from the international level, uh, there has to be very deliberate policies around uh, you know, really managing the dynamics uh, intra and, 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 and intra uh, trade dynamics between countries. I want to make sure that we're very uh, deliberate in terms of how we're setting levies and, 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 um, uh, and, and, and tariffs to really uh, ensure that we are bringing in the right food, uh, but at the same time, we're not just you know, opening our borders to home and other food products. And there has to be a balance between government policy uh, in terms of uh, import substitution versus uh, export-oriented uh, you know, uh, market or economy. I think there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of differences and disparity, even within national governments, where you see the Ministry of Agriculture pushing certain policies in favor of local production, and you see the, the Ministry of Trade and Investment pushing the other direction. So there has to be some sort of uh, you know, alignment uh, between government. One other thing that I would say very quickly is that we really need to scale the existing efforts of uh, many private sector organizations that are already investing deliberately in backward integration activities mm -hmm. at uh, the national level, at the community level. And we've, we have a number of examples in Africa of organizations that are deliberately investing in backward integration to source their raw materials locally, of course, to support smallholder producers and leave them out of poverty. Of course, that, of course, would increase household income. And that also helps those organizations to have access to the right raw materials for their processing. Um, and they're not just sourcing. They are also providing a lot of resources to those, those, those smallholder producers. They're training them. They are, they're giving them access to, to credit for them to produce. One last one. So, sorry, one last one. One last, last one, one really is we need to scale and support SMEs. I said it before, but I want to say it again. There are so many organizations, uh, non-profit organizations, that are actually supporting SMEs involved across the food value chain in Africa. Um, I'm being very specific about Africa because the bulk of our food is produced by those SMEs, particularly in processing. Uh, an example organization that I was sharing with a colleague uh, earlier this morning is African Food Change Makers that is really trying to build a home for about a million entrepreneurs, food entrepreneurs across, across the continent, currently in about 38 African countries. How do we identify those organizations and scale their activities to be able to really allow or help those SMEs to really build their business models and scale. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Tim. It's a middle-level approach that needs to be expanded, upscaled. So MSMEs, that is a very critical point that you raise there. But uh, last but not least, as I indicated earlier, let me move to Maria Jose here of Equidarian Tribune of Consumers and Users. And uh, Maria, if you've had from my introduction to the, uh, your fellow panelists here. Something I think is clear, that um, uh, the fabric of the food system is a little bit broken. 
is not very intact the way it should be. And therefore, patch up work my, cannot work. We have to really address it in totality. We have to give a major, major, major uh, work into this. Uh, what do you think would be some of those uh, changes, most important changes that are needed uh, to support uh, strong local food systems that will deliver on the consumer's right to food? Thank you, thank you for having me here. And uh, I, I'm going to read some uh, notes I, I prepared around this theme because I don't speak very well English, and uh, for me it's easier to, to, to read. It's okay. Yes. Yeah. I would like to address the importance of local and urban food systems that connect producers and consumers more directly, and how this would help to reduce food loss and waste, as well to strengthen access to nutrition and processed foods, and ensure a fair price for all. According to the definition of short marketing circuits, uh, there are a form of commerce based on the direct sale of fresh agriculture products or season products. In addition, to the fact that producers and consumers are generally in geographic proximity. The relationship between both have a maximum of one intermediary. And we can to cut the intermediation. That's very important for obtaining better prices both sides. Okay. The responsible consumers and user, the responsible consumer and user is one who, in addition to know the rights, the consumer rights, are guided by social and environmental criteria. It's very important to know how we can consume better, how we can be a sustainable consumer, with the, the respect to the, the nature, and respect the, the environment, and respect the other consumers. Because our habits can uh, have a very uh, have impact the nature and, have, and can impact the other consumers and the social uh, situation of other consumers. Uh, for instance, when some consumers, wealthy consumers, buy all the products in some mar market, they they, they, they uh, yeah, of course, they uh, impact to the others, the poor consumers. That's uh, one of the uh, aspects of uh, cons uh, uh, consumer sustainable, con uh, cons sustainable consumption. In order to contribute to a favorable environment for all and guarantee a consumption with the least possible impact on the environment, in the environment to contribute to improving the quality of life of the people who inhabit this planet and of the future generations. Um, my colleague in this in, uh, uh, spoke about that. It's very important, the future, how we consume now for the future. Uh, for that, it's important to uh, take into account food and environment. We need availability, affordability, Promotion, education, advertising, and information, food quality and safety. We need, to, as consumers, we need to have a good environment to consume, to consumption, because um, we have rights and obligations. Our obligation is choose well, but we need have the products to choose well. Uh, for that, is important. Important also have meeting points, direct sales in production, direct sales in local fairs, sales in store collective points of sale, restaurants, retailers, others, and local supermarkets, maybe, delivery, advanced sale, sales through electronic commerce, safe, safe especially, sale electronic commerce, direct consumption at the place of production, direct sales of, to institutional programs in the public sector. The public sector is very important because he, the public sector can push 
uh, the providers to have a better situation and becomes a good thing for the consumers. Have better um, things to choose, products to choose. And in, uh, in, now in Tribuna, we have a um, project, we are developing a project with the women of five uh, provinces in Ecuador, uh, organized women, women, and uh, is around best practices of consumption and uh, especially uh, food consumption. And uh, we try to, uh, to uh, push them to, uh, to buy in the global, in the, in, the, in the local market. For that, it's very important to have the, the support of the local government also. To stop you, but just where you are, uh, if you could just go a little bit further on getting a specifics of what role would the consumer organizations, both local and international, play in terms of what you have said very correctly, choosing well, yes. involving private sector, you know, what role would they play? Maybe just one minute, because we want to now uh, give it to the audience. We, uh, our role is to uh, educate the consumers, yes. to inform consumers, yes. to to, uh, we need to learn to choose, and it's important to have a good labeling, for instance. If you, in the label, you have the advertising and the information about salt, grease, and sugar, that's very important. In Ecuador, we have the, the, the lights, red, uh, or, and green, green, and uh, yellow. And in other countries of Latin America, there are the hexagons or octagons, black octagons, to um, aware to 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 advise the consumers around this consumption. And as organization, we need to work all day about these 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 problems. No, no. Uh, it's a, it's a, a global effort organization by, by, by organization to obtain achievements. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. That, that's very clear. And actually, you have uh, triggered something that is related to what Alice said. And uh, she has just one point, which is she's going to do in under one minute, Then, I, because I want to open it to the audience. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope I can be heard. Uh, for us to achieve sustainability, if we want to achieve sustainable food systems transformation, we have to be sustainable consumers. We have to uh, also have along the value chain, we need to have sustainable producers. So we have to produce sustainably and consume sustainably by consuming safe food, avoiding wastage, and that is good for us and good for the environment. And for us to achieve that also, I want to encourage those organizations that are represented here. Please try to encourage, and the African setup, women play a very key role in food systems transformation. We need to encourage women, especially the small farm holders, to ensure that they produce safe food and nutritious food for their family. And we want to encourage the youth also to uptake. For agriculture to be achieved, then we have to encourage those uh, sectors to be uh, sustainable and ensure that they are taking a key role. Thank you, um, uh, She says, that even the aspect of sustainability has to be given a value chain approach. Yes. From production all the way to consumption. We have to engrave it all through. I want to post something as I give it to the audience. Maria is something said private sector. The question we have now on the agriculture producers and now on the consumers, are farmers private sector? are consumers, private sector. I want that to be in your mind, even as you want to engage now with the, with, the, with the experts over here. I don't know who has the mic or how we've been doing it, but I just want to see a hand. You can comment, uh, and add value to what the experts have said, or you can raise a question uh, to any specific expert here, 
or to anybody in the audience. We've got about 10 minutes, and we need to do this uh, fast, colleagues. Um, anybody? All right. Um, about five minutes, I'm being told. Oh, over there? Over there, over th All right, all right. Even behind there, and then this one there. So I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, ladies first, so I'll start there. <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start there, and then I'm, I'm there, and then, then over there. Yes? Uh, thank you. As the many people from the dais said about uh, sustainability in uh, food system, uh, are we having some guidelines on the, on the platform like this? On production to uh, consumption, everything should be on the basis of agroecological -ec zone buy local, uh, eat local, and consume whatever is traditional and local food, and keep the influencers away to have everything global food. So that's no great. That that can help us to attain the sustainability in the field of food. No, true. We're gonna have to be cognizant of the agroecological zones. Where are we producing what, and how are then we we moving? Um, over, it's, it's, okay, as he picks the mic, I'm here. Je suis euh, le président Ivaka, président de la Fédération nationale des associations de consommateurs de Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, pour cette question de consommation durable, de production durable, du système alimentaire de façon générale, nous, de notre point de vue, au plan africain, après toutes les conférences, tous les séminaires que nous écoutons, le véritable problème que nous avons constaté, c'est le problème de la pauvreté, le problème du financement. Le problème, c'est que toutes les politiques parlent de durable, consommer durable, production durable, même nos États sont en train d'attendre le financement des différents COP. COP 21, COP 28, on entend les financements au niveau étatique. Ça fait que quand nos États eux-mêmes n'ont pas de moyens pour pouvoir financer leur politique en tant que gouvernement, nos sociétés civiles qui attendent de l'État, le plus souvent, les financements n'étant pas suffisants à ce niveau, ça ne descend pas vers la société civile. Et donc, les coopératives de production vivrière qui sont, qui sont mises en place n'ont pas de financement. Nous-mêmes, consommateurs, nous sommes encerclés par des systèmes de vente où les producteurs eux-mêmes suscitent des détaillants et entre producteurs, importateurs et détaillants, il y a des demi-grossistes où il y a des systèmes de monopole, où il y a des systèmes euh, qui font en sorte que les prix sont très élevés. Et donc, le véritable problème du consommateur africain, c'est le financement. Et donc, nous, en Côte d'Ivoire, nous avons réfléchi. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes en train de promouvoir ce que c'est que la consommation locale le consommer local. Le mois d'octobre est devenu mois de consommer local adopté par le gouvernement ivoirien avec les propositions des consommateurs que nous sommes. Nous venons d'organiser la foire du consommer local qui va se faire chaque deux ans. Le mois de novembre, cinq jours de foire pour pouvoir prendre des dispositions. Ce que nous avons fait, c'est que les producteurs locaux qui font moins cher et nous, organisations de consommateurs, nous avons signé un partenariat pour mettre en place une sorte de coopérative de consommateurs. De sorte que tous ceux qui font des ventes promotionnelles, qui vendent moins cher, on puisse avoir l'information et donner l'information directement aux consommateurs pour qu'ils puissent acheter à chaque fois auprès du producteur ou du commerçant qui vend moins cher. Et cela a été digitalisé, au point que, désormais, chaque consommateur qui passe par cette application que nous avons mise en place va acheter moins cher, 
et il se trouve un cashback que les opérateurs dégagent sur le compte du consommateur pour pouvoir lui permettre d'avoir un seul, une sorte de bon cumulé pour pouvoir accroître son pouvoir d'achat. Et ce pouvoir d'achat qui sera accumulé va lui permettre non seulement d'acheter et de pouvoir investir. Donc c'est un système que nous sommes en train de faire entre les producteurs, les commerçants qui vendent moins cher et les consommateurs. La dame disait, il y a trop de, de personnes d'intermédiaires. Donc quand le consommateur est lié directement au producteur ou à l'importateur, nous on prend le prix au niveau du producteur ou de les, du, du producteur et puis ce prix-là, ça arrête le consommateur lambda en bas. Et donc on brise les intermédiaires pour que on puisse avoir de quoi avoir un pouvoir d'achat très élevé et puis investir pour pouvoir faire tout ce qui est consommation durable, production durable et autres. Parce que c'est un problème de financement. Je vous remercie. Thank you, thank you so much. That really has added value to the conversation, but uh, I got very little out of that myself. And, uh, this okay. is, <laughs> but I listened attentively, I and I think the interpretation was on the floor. And surely we are going to fight after this because we needed to have sorted that out. Can, can we hear from there? Thank you. Mine is Our, just, we have uh, under one minute, please. Say something about uh, mine is uh, yes, small. Uh, what I want to ask is uh, in saving food system, a country like now African countries where regulation is uh, so poor, uh, what is happening is uh, there are a lot of unregulated uh, pesticides and commodities that come to this country or continent. Well so what is consumer, uh, uh, an international consumer agency or uh, uh, doing in terms of educating or helping communities in some of these things that are subject to actually being, uh, affecting actually the food system? Because Kenya, uh, close to 340 uh, pesticides or chemicals that are used are banned from the country of origin. And uh, what you are consuming is whatever that has been uh, gone through that uh, pesticides and those chemicals. Yeah. So how and what is happening in other countries to address such? Yeah. Thank no, you, Paul. No, thank you. It's a serious uh, issue you raise. Why would a country ban a pesticide but still export it to some other country? That's a question we need to ask. I need to take only three, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Forgive okay. me, time is not on our side. Now, because you are on your feet already, uh, yeah. keep it short. Yes. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, I can't Sorry, sorry. You can repeat. You got it. Yes. Uh, what if you did sugar or jizid? And the mother metal commissa, the mother metal under one minute, please. Yes. Yes. I'm pressed for time. Please repeat, please repeat.
على في على مجال الغذاء والقدره الشرائيه للمستهلك السؤال الثاني ما دور جهود الحكومات في تعاملها مع تقلبات المناخ وكذلك التقلبات السياسيه التي تؤثر كذلك على المستهلك وشكرا جزيلا Okay. Okay. No, thank you so thank much. You. That's very clear. I, I want to, because of time, this is what I'll do. Greg, please take for me the first question uh, with, 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 with the person directly. Um, Ruth, take for me the second question directly over there. Uh, after the session. Uh, I got the last hand there. Shelly is on my neck, Shelley. please. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Jay Enchelen from Asim Mauritius. Uh, what, what we're talking about in this session, it's about maybe four or five of the SDGs. The first one is poverty eradication, access to food. Huh? The second one, SDG 2, is zero hunger. SDG, SDG 3 is all good health good health and well-being. SDG 5 is clean water, which is food. And SDG 12 is responsible consumption and production. That is about access to food, security. We are talking about that, we are covering. The other aspect is Codex Alimentarius, about food safety. I think all our governments, all our governments in various parts of the world, they have adopted the 17 SDGs, okay? And most of them are in Codex Alimentarius. So the lobbying aspect to be done by Consumers International, I believe, and consumer organizations is to get our governments, our respective governments, you know, to respect and follow on the commitment they have taken for the SDGs <coughs> and also for food safety that they carry on with the Codex Alimentarius. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring it to a close. I'm so sorry about this. We're going to have to bring it to a close. But um, actually, part of what he says answers uh, the gentleman who just spoke actually over there. Do you promise, where's Shelley? Can you just, uh, one minute, you don't say no when uh, this lady has already raised her hand and this gentleman here. So do you promise to make it under a minute? 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just please. for clarification about the sustainability, which is the main topic in yeah. this session. Yeah. The sustainability of the, it's related to the production and to the support of the agro-industry. And don't forget that the food system, it's very important to highlight that the food adaptation yeah. about the climate change, it's very important, mm -hmm. and food resilience. So we need to support all the local production because in the crisis, we didn't have any solution to decrease the price of the essential production without supporting Thank the you. local production. Please pass okay. for me the mic okay. here. To this, the last one over here. Pa pass the mic to uh, the gentleman over here. The, the, and this is the last, George. last George. of last. George, no. Oh, it was okay. Go ahead, and then uh, we <clears throat> love to because it was you. I meant. I... Thank you, uh, all present. I have only two questions. One, the first one. Uh, one of the presenters said that a policy direction for African countries to minimize the price of agri food products. Is there any way, can you develop this such policy in between in Comesa country? I develop a supply food, food supply chain management in Ethiopia now. One of the difficult things is, is price regulation. Price regulation is a very difficult issue. It's related to the cost of production as well as the cost of inputs used. So is there any suggestion on this issue? The second one. There are a lot of terms used by presenter. Safety, security, sustainability. These are somehow contradictory terms, especially safety and security, a little bit contradictory, especially in our country or in Africa. 
I had a meeting in Dakar. Dakar, okay. Okay. Because, let, because let, of let, time. Let's we, finalize. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there any possibility to balance such yeah. terminologies? Yeah. I, I will. I will give the audience, please. So we. Uh, so we close. Yeah. Just three points, very briefly. One is uh, when we are talking about the sustainable food system. I want to bring in the issue of uh, tobacco cultivation, uh, because a, about four million hectares of land, fertile land is used in 125 countries as a cash crop to uh, cultivate tobacco, which is adversely affecting. In the low and middle income countries, out of the 10 countries which is growing tobacco, four are in severe food insecurity. Yep. So we need to look into that. Second point is, when we are talking about sustainable food system, we need to look at the wastage between the production and the uh, uh, consumption. Almost 40 percentage of food produced in India is uh, simply wasted before it reaching the consumer hand. All Just right. last point about the, the uh, preventing the, the pesticides. You know, recently in India, we have banned some of the pesticides and the manufacturers were telling, allow us to produce here. We won't distribute here. We will export that to African countries and other countries. Yeah. Like, so we need to, uh, you know, to tackle that also. Issue, like, and uh, uh, let, let, that. ladies and gentlemen, I don't yeah. think we would have the best time to end it. That is the high. And could we give a round of applause first to the audience themselves? And also to allow me to appreciate the experts here on the panel, please, one more time. And to, and to the organizers of this wonderful session on food systems transformation, can we applaud also ourselves? And lastly is to me for having moderated. Thank you so much.